Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guests today are many. Uh, there are about five or six of us on this call. Um, we're going to be talking about ayahuasca and psychedelics and the role they play or may play in um, exploring consciousness and facilitating awakening. Um, I've already gotten some feedback from people asking me why I was even having this conversation because some people consider this to be outside the realm of legitimate spiritual endeavor. Uh, but I must say that and, and you know, and I've considered, I've thought that way for many years myself, having indulged in this in the late 60s, some of it, and then, you know, my experience was basically that LSD knocked holes in the wall and showed me there was something outside the house, but then I was left with a house with holes in the wall, and it took me years to repair those and, um, you know, get to use the doors and windows properly. Uh, but... In listening to the folks that I'm going to be speaking with today um, over the past week, watching Rat Grazam's movie, listening to Chris Botch's uh, talk in a, in a conference, and, and so on, I was so impressed with everyone's eloquence and clarity and, and depth of sincerity and, and understanding that it really was a sort of a boundary breaker for me uh, and kind of uh, helped me expand my understanding of, or just legitimize the whole thing more deeply, but not without provisos and cautions and so on, which we'll be talking about. So first I'd like to introduce all the people who are going to be participating in this. It'll take me a couple minutes to read a brief uh, bio on each of them, and then we'll get into it. So uh, I think I'll go from east to west. Um, first there's Christopher Bosch, and uh, PhD who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Youngstown State University, where he taught for over 30 years in psychology of religion, transpersonal studies, Buddhism, and world religions. He is also adjunct professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, and for two years was the director of transformative learning at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma, California. <clears throat> An award-winning teacher and international speaker, his work explores the philosophical implications of deep, non-ordinary states of consciousness, especially psychedelic states. He has written a pioneering book in psychedelic philosophy and collective consciousness, Dark Night, Early Dawn, Steps to a Deep Ecology of Mind. In addition, he has written Life Cycles, Reincarnation and the Web of Life, a comprehensive study of reincarnation and karma in light of new information emerging in contemporary consciousness research. In his book, The Living Classroom, Chris presents his revolutionary ideas concerning the transpersonal dimensions of teaching. <clears throat> In addition to working with sacred medicines, Chris has been a Buddhist practitioner for many years. So I just should have done this a second ago, but I just brought Chris's image on the screen for you to see him. Uh, so welcome, Chris. <clears throat> welcome, Rick. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Nice sure. to be here. Um, Jeffrey and C.L. Backstrom, working to the west. Now they're, they, they live about a block south of me in Fairfield, Iowa, and they're among many people who make Fairfield an interesting place to live. Uh, they call their work Stepping into Freedom, explaining that, quote, with each step we release or transcend old limiting patterns of being, seeing, acting, and open to the beings our souls are calling us here to become. <clears throat> they offer shamanic healing work and deep practices to facilitate embodied awakening and opening to the soul's calling. In the past several years, Jeffrey and CL have studied with indigenous medicine workers and teachers in the Andes and the Amazon Basin, who represent ancient traditions grounded in the sacred feminine and Mother Earth. Since 2009, they've been welcoming their students to accompany them to experience these connections for themselves. These traditional practices include the use of sacred plants in healing, divination, and spiritual transformation. Talat Jonathan Phillips is co-founder, he's in San Francisco, working west, is co-founder of the cutting-edge web magazine Reality Sandwich and the Evolver Network. He's a well-regarded life coach and bioenergetic <coughs> healer who has been practicing for over a decade. His memoir, The Electric Jesus, The Healing Journey of a Contemporary Gnostic, has become one of the must-read books of the new consciousness movement for its honest portrayal of life on the emerging edge of the transformational culture. He is creator of the Ayahuasca Monologues, Tales of the Spirit Vine, a religion blogger for the Huffington Post, a Reiki master and bioenergetic healer 
who does Skype sessions for clients around the world and in his San Francisco office. Finally, in, on the east coast of Australia, Rak Razam is the author of two books, Aya, A Shamanic Odyssey, a travel memoir of his time with shamans in the Peruvian Amazon, and a companion volume of interviews, The Ayahuasca Sessions, published by Icaro. In 2006, he visited Peru on a feature magazine assignment to see what the almost mythical archetype of the shaman was really like in the 21st century. Excerpts from Aya, A Shamanic, shamanic Odyssey, have been published in Australian Penthouse, High Times, and Filmmaker Magazine Online. He was also interviewed and appears in the CBC's 2007 audio documentary, In Search of the Divine Vegetal, talking about his ayahuasca experiences, which have, has been broadcast twice due to spe special demand to millions of people throughout North America. The founding editor of Undergrowth, Australia's leading counterculture arts and literature magazine, Razam is an experiential journalist who participates in the experiences he writes about, giving his global audience an intimate familiarity with his subjects. Great. So that introduces all of you. Now, uh, I realized as I was preparing for this interview that there was no way I was going to have a clear structure in mind of points that we would actually follow. Uh, but I have a feeling that once we get rolling, um, we'll just roll and we'll have no problem filling up a delightful two hours or so with this discussion. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I don't take this whole topic uh, lightly or trivially in any way, and I don't think any of you have approached it that way. Um, you know, in the, in the late 60s, people were just thrill seekers, 90% of them, in, in the use of psychedelic drugs, and there were many casualties. And I'm afraid that today this is also the case, and perhaps one of you can suggest what the percentages might be, but I, I really wonder, in addition to the direct casualties of people in, in indulging in substances which they probably don't have the adequate preparation to, uh, to use, um, there are, there's also a sort of a dark underbelly that's developed in, in Peru at least of people who uh, have, are in it for the money and there have been instances of um, you know sexual um, abuse um, of people who are, who are down there high on ayahuasca and all kinds of strange things so and here in my town uh, there's a young woman who took ayahuasca and has been in and out of mental hospitals ever since. So I don't, I'm not doing this discussion as a kind of a come one, come all invitation and encouragement for anybody who has the slightest inclination to go ahead and experiment in whatever way presents itself to them. Uh, mm. I I'm, would say from the outset that if one is going to explore this area, it should be done with the utmost seriousness under the guidance of someone who really knows what they're doing. And if you're not sure that those criterion have been met, don't proceed until you are. So that's my, I'd that's like my to, uh, I'd like to jump in and maybe answer a bit of that question or comment on that. I, I um, use some of those terms myself. There's this difference between seekers and thrill seekers. And some of those uh, analogies you were saying to the 1960s I think are very apt. But I think we need to be very careful about the language and how we frame this conversation because underneath this idea is still the seeking. And so whether people think they're doing this recreationally or think they're doing it for some type of thrill, what's beneath that? What we're really, what we're really talking about here is the fact that usually Western people who have been very distanced from a spiritual reality, who have been taught uh, you know, over multiple generations, if not... Ten, like thousands of years now, that there is nothing but a, a reductionist, mechanical approach to what reality is, and to the fact that they have bodies, they're meant to go, you know, go through the education system, little white picket fence reality, be good consumers, and shop. They're really distanced from this ability to connect to themselves, whatever modality that that takes. But um, this idea of thrill seekers, I think, is a bit of a misnomer as well, because I think what's really happening is that there is a really deep thirst and hunger in the human experience that these people have and the only language we have for it 
in a consumerist Western culture is thrill-seeking. It's like this whole idea about escapism. If you look at the, the, the vast majority of the entertainment uh, you know, complex at the moment, it's actually escapist. There's like, there's like tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who stare at their screens you know, for, for most, of, most of the day and they, they, they engage in a virtual world which is sold to them by, by the, you know, the corporate establishment. But it's, it's this quest for something deeper which people really want. So when I first went down to Peru in 2006, it was very obvious that there was a business of spirituality and a business of shamanism going on. And it's all about the supply and demand that, yes, many people on the ground there in Peru and in the West are catering to this hunger and this, this thirst for connection to spirit. Um, and, you know, do we call, they might be thrill seekers, but there's also, as you say, there's a smaller majority of people within the, what we call thrill seekers who are seekers. One, one idea that I came to reconcile this disparity is this idea that there used to be in, I guess, Christian terminology, this idea of the pilgrim and many people going down to Peru and going on this journey of the soul, we might call them recreational users, we might call them thrill seekers, but really they're going on a very, um, a very deep journey. You know, they're going away from their, their native land, they're going to, this, to the jungle and to these foreign environments, and they're undertaking a, a rigorous and very arduous experience. And so, you know, I, I don't like to pigeonhole people, and I understand there's lots of dynamics in the business of spirituality, embedded in that and there's lots of issues around duty of care and the safeguards that the industry of shamanism must be taking up to safeguard people who are participating. But just to the core of that question, this idea of thrill seekers or seekers or why people are doing this at all, I think it's really because, and I've spoken to many, many curanderos, the shamans of the Amazon, and they basically said at the outset that, you know, choosing these statistics pretty randomly, but there's a certain segment of people who are very identifiably going down for healing and for the healing that not just ayahuasca but the, the other dieta and, and the reconnection can bring. But the vast majority of people, they said, weren't sick in the traditional sense that their patients were. But what they recognized was that there was a sickness, but it wasn't perhaps a physical sickness, it was a malaise of the soul. It was this idea of disconnection from their spirit and from, from connecting to nature, you know, how, how we connect to nature with the great spirit. And so the, these people were really, the curanderos were understanding, they were really, yes, a lot of them are in, in search of the visions and the visionary component of ayahuasca, because you know, modern Western culture is very visually driven. But underneath all of that, what I really believe is happening is that there's this Western hunger for a reconnection to spirit and to an authenticity that, that these experiences can bring. So I, I think that's really important to, uh, to reframe that question and look at it in those contexts. Good. Um. I agree, and uh, I didn't. Uh, hopefully, in using the term "thrill seeker," I didn't mean mean to insult anyone. Um, I'm just saying that this this is something which shouldn't be, in my opinion, this is this whole thing is something which shouldn't be approached in any kind of trivial sense. Um, there should be, ideally, at least, there should be a deep sincerity and earnestness of, and you know, purposefulness, and um, the, perhaps the more of that there is, the more Profund, the profundity you're going to get out of it and um, the more benefits you're going to get out of it. I don't know. There, there should probably also be, although this is maybe naive to assume this is going to happen, but maybe it will in time, some sort of screening process, you know, so that people who, both of curanderos and of participants, so that firstly you don't get um, uh, bogus guys, you know, running, setting up workshops or whatever they do, and and you know, actually harming people. And secondly, so that people who are on Prozac or uh, you know have some kind of problem, which would really be counterindicated in terms of the use of this, are, aren't just sort of rushing into it blindly and and getting into trouble as a result. Yeah. Uh, Rick, can I say something on this? Because you mentioned thrill seeking, and that's a bit of my specialty. <laughs> and, and I feel like, you know, I'm a healer and one of the hugest therapeutic things I realized this year is fun and finding your edge and learning it and exploring it is one of the most powerful things you can do when you're prepared in a safe way like you're talking for healing. Um, if I look back growing up, the most spiritual experiences I had was skiing. Mm. I was in the elements there was this element of adrenaline, there was tests, there was challenges, and there was a sense of freedom. 
And I feel like when you engage in certain psychedelic experiences, if you don't engage with some sense of inner adventure and outer adventure, you may have a victim story that's going to play out. And honestly, if we're talking about trauma, which I think a lot of people are healing from, abuses in the family line, sexual lines, the whole thing, you're talking about adrenaline. Because adrenaline comes in the system and it overpowers the system and then we have fight or flight modes and people are stuck in these things. So I actually think a study of thrill seeking and the deeper seeking that Rock was talking about is key for kind of reclaiming adrenaline and letting it flow in healing the overall system. I've noticed it, like, I, I became obsessed with big wave surfers because they literally, as an energy healer, they were riding giant waves of energy for massive adrenaline kind of, like, rewards in it. And I think you have to be careful of that. Um, I think there's an addictive thrill-seeking, but I do think being prepared and being a good psychedelic surfer is, like, key to going into this work because a sense of bravery, what I heard Rock talking about is almost like a hero's journey. And if we're going to overcome a lot of the personal societal issues that are kind of embedded in our psyches, I do think a sense of courage and hum humility combined are key in accessing these more complex biodynamic dimensions that can be opened up. Good. Let me, uh, Chris or one of the Backstroms, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I would, well, I'd like to, on, like, along the same topic, one of the times that Jeffrey and I took a group of people to Peru to the jungle to go to one of the retreat centers, and this particular center was established by a woman, an Australian woman, who was an, is an addiction counselor. She herself is an alcoholic, although she's not currently drinking. And she found that with her clients that she felt like the talk therapy she was doing with them was bringing them to a state of sobriety, but not very quickly and not very permanently. So she started bringing in ayahuasca as another way, another medicine that might be able to get to the deeper causes, unroot the deeper causes of their addiction. She herself is not a curandero, and so she doesn't lead the ceremonies, but she would bring her clients to um, other curanderos in South America, and then she would then coach them throughout the week of their of their ayahuasca ceremonies and things like that. Anyway, she's set up herself a whole center herself, and a lot of the clients that come there have addictions. But when Jeffrey and I found her, we didn't go there because we had particular chemical addictions, but I just trusted that she was all about healing, and the shamans she would work with were about healing. So one time when we went there with a group of people, and these were all, all people that were seeking awakening, I, the first night, in my first night of ceremony, a lot of difficult material came up for me physically and emotionally, such that the shaman, who was also working with us, not just the medicine we drank, but was working through his sacred songs and other kind of extraction processes he used. He worked with aromatherapies and light therapies as well as the songs. But the next time he said, Ciel, I don't want you to drink tonight. I want you to come to ceremony. I want to do healing practices on you, but I don't want you to drink. And then two nights later, he said, Ciel, great, I want you to come to ceremony. I don't want you to drink. And so of this trip we went, there were going to be five ceremonies, and he did not have me drink ayahuasca, three of those five ceremonies. He gave me some perfumed water to drink. Different people on the retreat came to me and said, aren't you disappointed? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I did not come here for experiences. I came here for healing. And I'm trusting that this man is finding the best path, best path of healing for me that's using other plants. He was doing other healing processes with me during the day as well. And so for me, the whole idea of going to, to the jungle where this plant grows with people who who for, um, has been part of their culture for a long, long, long time, where healing is more of their intention. And it's not to say that there aren't newer um, shamans down there that are out for money, but there are very many reliable healing centers and curanderos down there who really have it as their intention, a holistic healing for their clients. And it may or may not you um, and, and Ayahuasca may not may be the main ingredient of the healing that they are invoking in people. So, yes, I do like the fact that it's important to be looking for the center and the iOS caras that you're working with, but it isn't all about experience. It's more, more to me, it's more about healing, healing, however that comes with a whole 
you know, bunch of different kinds of plants and healing techniques, mm -hmm. of which ayahuasca was still his teacher that informed him mm -hmm. how to work with me in a different way. Good. It's very difficult to make generalizations in this situation because there's so many different types of psycho psychoactive substances and so many different contexts and so many different healers that work in different ways. Uh, fundamentally, and, and I understand the reservations that the spiritual community, particularly the temp contemplative community, has uh, towards psychedelics. We have that old historical prohibitions against drugs which cloud the mind in Buddhism, and psychedelics have often been interpreted as drugs that fall under that category. Um, to me, the critical difference, whether there is spiritual value uh, to working conscientiously with psychedelics, is first, whether you're working recreationally or working therapeutically. And I think we're all on the same page that it's therapeutic work, which is the important work. But then, when you're, I mean, when you're working even therapeutically, um, the states that one enters into are temporary. That's the nature of the beast. They're, they're temporary. So the critical condition, I think, is how you choose to work with these temporary conditions and whether you're trying to affect a, a fundamental shift in the baseline of consciousness, <coughs> fundamental uh, healing of the various pathologies of ordinary life so that consciousness can become more pliant, can become more open, relaxed, uh, more sensitive to its own ground of being. Uh, if that work is being done in that fashion, I think it can be very helpful and can be well integrated into uh, contemplative practice. If it's not being done in that way, if, it, if it's not being used to confront the deepest hurts of the human spirit, then it's probably a distraction in, in one way or another. Um, I just want to say that, I mean, the effects of meditation are temporary too, you know, it's a non-drug thing, but they're cumulative. You meditate every day, then there's a cumulative influence over time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and I, obviously the same would be true of drugs, they're cha producing a change in the brain or, or whatever. And I'm sort of curious about, um, I mean, I'm, in listening to uh, some of your talks, Chris, uh, you mentioned that at a certain point you decided to kind of ease off on the high dosage LSD explore, ex explorations because it was taking a toll on your body and perhaps especially on your subtle body. And um, I just, I, I guess I have, you know, I'm just throwing out, playing devil's advocate here, throwing out mm -hmm. some of my doubts and questions. I, I wonder about the subtle influences of these things. Um, I think Rock said in his movie that. Um, Ayahuasca actually has a cleansing influence on the brain, or I read that someplace. It flushes the brain clean and, and improves receptor sites. So that's interesting if it's true. Um, uh, you, sometimes you hear about the use of drugs causing receptor sites to be less receptive to the body's own chemi chem chemicals that it produces when it's become dependent upon uh, ingested chemicals. So, I, I, and particularly, I, I guess that's true of the harmful ones like heroin, which I guess lowers your receptivity to, to natural serotonin or something, or so I've heard. So I'm just wondering, like, people who have been, some of these curanderos who have been doing this since the age of 14, uh, and now they're maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s, how did they strike you as human beings? Um, you know, we have a certain image in mind of enlightenment and what that might be. All of us from our various backgrounds have pretty clear conceptions about that. Um, do these fellows seem to be measuring up to that um, type of thing? Uh, I mean, Rock said in his movie that certainly most of these people are still flawed human beings, and of course the same could be said of most Eastern gurus, <laughs> you know, the various things that end up happening. Uh, but what is the long-term influence? And as in the case of uh, CL, is there a certain point at which further ingestion of chemicals would be contraindicated because you don't need them anymore. You've already has achieved whatever it is they're, they're capable of uh, providing. Or is it a never-ending investigation? To give context, the, uh, the quote that you mentioned is in, in my film, My Awakenings, uh, it's looking at the study that was done in the early 1990s by uh, Charles Grob, I think, and Dennis McKenna and a few other uh, Western scientists and doctors who were studying members of church groups like Ineo de Vegetal um, for uh, looking, at, looking at what regular ayahuasca use did to them on a physiological level. And they did, you know, double bind controlled uh, test studies on them and they, they found that um, basically ayahuasca was 
working on the receptor sites in the brain and it was basically flushing everything clean and almost like defragging like on your computer when you do regular maintenance, you know. It's like it was linking everything back up and so it had a very verifiable, scientifically proven, um, you know, healthy effect on the brain structure as well as working as a, as a purgative and working to cleanse the body as well. What they also noted in that study though was that it was also the follow-up and not just the peak experience, but it was the follow-up in the, the days and weeks around the ayahuasca ceremonies with groups like you know, de Vegetal who were a community. And so it was that integration time which was so important to um, the holistic nature of the experience and to integrating it into their lives. Um, but ayahuasca does have that, that effect as a, uh, as a cleansing agent as well as the psychic sort of effect that it, it has as well. And you, you were mentioning earlier as well just the um, you know, the hardship, I, I think that all pathways were saying that, you know, meditation is temporary and ayahuasca is temporary. All these things are pathways which are available to us in the gamut of experience that nature has provided. And, you know, there has been, as you mentioned as well, there has been a stigma associated with uh, not just psychedelics, but psychedelics and magic and even tantra and what is often referred to, I guess, as the left-hand pathways of the shortcuts. Um, you know, it, it, I, I don't think that there's, um, there's necessarily any, uh, uh, it, they might get you, get you to the point short in a shorter amount of time, but there's no less depth to the experience. It's, it's just a matter of guidance and of context and of being able to um, integrate the experience. And I guess with a, with a more peak experience thing, maybe that can be more of a challenge to integrate. But, you know, I think that the value that ayahuasca generally brings as a medicine, which is what it is called in Peru and, you know, all people around the world who are taking it up understand it's not a drug, it is a medicine. And um, we were talking before about this, I guess it's unproven spiritual belief that, you know, uh, drugs can put holes in your aura or things like that, which makes a lot of sense. You know, when we're talking about an energy body or an energy field or a light body, um, things which often... Uh, marshal all the chi and all the energy of the body into a peak experience may leave, you know, uh, a deficit somewhere else or may peak and may cause cause issues around that. But I think with, with ayahuasca, no matter how rigorous it is, and it can be very, very hard on people, you can go through that dark night of the soul and, and face your shadow. Um, biologically and neurochemically, it is it is a medicine because it, it, it can be a hard, you know, thing to, to, to swallow figuratively and literally but it is actually purging and it is helping release and it's helping bring to the surface a lot of the shadow material. Um, so I'm not really sure if it's if it's going to be damaging on that same effect as some of the more uh, somatic drugs, you know, or the, the Western sort of drugs like heroin and cocaine and things like that might be doing. Um, but it, it is taxing and demanding as well. But generally what I want to say about, you know, ayahuasca um, and I, I, I guess DMT to some, some levels as a separate adjunct as well, um, is that these things, what I feel, as well as working on the body and working to cleanse on that level, is that they're also helping to raise the vibration. So this idea about the energetic body and if it's um, damaging it or not, and everything needs to be done in moderation and there needs to be you know, very um, much respect paid to the integration process and how, how this informs our, our lives. Um, but I think over time, cumulatively, what they are doing, as well as setting up neural pathways, and as well as bringing the unconscious into the conscious for healing and working on the shadow material, I feel that what they're doing is that they're feeding that light body and they're raising the vibrational uh, nature of ourselves and then it's up to um, what we do with that in the world, how we retain that because what all the curanderos say, it's no point in having a peak experience with ayahuasca and then going straight back onto the coffee and salt and sugar and pork and alcohol and sex the next day or the next week and not changing your behaviour, not changing your patterns. So what the ayahuasca medicine can do is it can reveal your own patterns and it can reveal your own nature to yourself and it can help heal. I mean, you know, we ourselves are the one who do the healing, I believe, in concert with the spirit of the plant. Um, it's not just the ayahuasca neurochemically which is healing, it's what it's revealing and our abilities within ourselves that really do the healing. But then that needs to be integrated into our lives and if we do that, the curandero say you retain the vibration that you've gained and cleansed on ayahuasca. And, you know, as opposed to many other drugs and even with psychedelics, um, I don't know if, you know, neurochemically, I know things like LSD can put a, a, you know, a toxic load on the body and into the liver and things like that, but ayahuasca seems to be sort of unique amongst the, the gamut of plant, planetary entheogens is that it does, it does work as a healing agent, a cleansing agent, and it can help to raise the vibration if we participate 
in that integration process afterwards. Mm. So if the, if the vomiting or the purging that takes place is um, symptomatic of s purification of, you know, uh, stuff from the, from the psyche or from, from deep in the body, uh, do the most experienced users, such as the curanderos of themselves, still drink, are they able to drink the stuff without vomiting because they've been purified of everything that needs purifying? I mean, we're, we're generalizing again here because not everyone purges, you know, it's like I, 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 I've experienced it, sometimes I don't purge, other people don't purge. I, I do find that people who are uh, more clean, you know, physically, if they're maybe vegetarian or maybe, you know, they're, they're, just, not, they're just not taking in the impurities or the, the processed foods or the sugars and salts and things like that. If you have a more of a clean bioenergetic system to begin with, then you have the sensitivity that's needed. So the curanderos quite often might only have a sip of a cup or maybe not a cup at all. Usually they will have a, at least a homeopathic dose just to be in the vibrational frequency and to, to touch base with that to then go into the realm. And working in ceremony, they don't you know, traditionally want to have a big dose. They want to be able to navigate and be able to physically um, facilitate in ceremony. But you know, the, the curanderos and even very sensitive people, sometimes you can drink a cup of ayahuasca, it may come straight up again, or maybe you don't even get to drink it at all. But if you are so close to the vibrational frequency of it, sometimes that's all that's needed. You can tune into someone else's journey or you can tune into the, the subtle vibration. So you know, people who don't vomit and aren't clean, sometimes I find that they've got this real resistance and there's a, there's a, there's a vibrational resistance to opening to the medicine. And the curanderos can sing an ikaro, one of their the magical songs, or that that um, they invoke the vibration, and they can do a, an ikaro to make someone purge, or to bring on the visions, or many many other sort of uh, facilities that they can do. But it's really about the sensitivity of our energetic bodies to the medicine, and then to also the dimensional realms that the medicine opens up. Okay, good. Um, Jeffrey, you haven't had a chance to say anything yet. Would you like to chime in? Well, following on that, it wouldn't be a bad time to, um, you know, try and tie in a couple of these threads because we've sounded a little like blind guys trying to describe the elephant. But, you know, they, the plant in the Amazon is sometimes referred to as our teacher and sometimes as the doctor. So those are the two aspects that we refer to when we talk about healing, we talk about purging, we talk about clearing and cleaning the body. and on the other hand, when we give attention to what are the um, visionary uh, components of the experience or what kind of things are revealed to us, um, I'll just give you a, another personal example. So one of the um, pieces that I worked on one time uh, had to do with some really early childhood wounding, which of course everybody this day and age uh, thinks that's what happened to them and um, a lot of what happened to us is that but the ayahuasca then showed me where that came from and even generally generationally and I had an experience an inward experience of going to my one of my parents in his childhood and seeing that wound in his field and extracting it and then experiencing uh, this great burden kind of lift off myself. Now it wasn't until um, a, a trip or two later that uh, the curandero I was working with wanted to show me a bit how, about how to do extractions and he said watch for the red um, spot or red light in that person's field which is what the experience had been that I had. So there was some teaching going on and some healing and uh, I'm sure we're going to hear from, from Chris particularly on the teaching side because I've loved uh, what he's contributed in terms of uh, depth psychology and this kind of work uh, from what's well, a little bit more of a Western perspective. But there's something I have to go back to and that is the reference you made early on, um, Rick, to a young woman who um, is now having a very hard time. Um, and it clearly seems to be connected to an experience that she had. Um, it's really important to recognize the need for care and I guess I'd have to say even for some kind of regulation. Things that are illegal um, fall into the hands of criminals. Uh, 
in part because there's no care taken by the broader culture to assure that those substances are going to be pure. And we've heard a lot of stories about people drinking ayahuasca that had some other plant mixed in. Uh, sometimes this is done to make the person more um, all open to suggestion from a ne'er-do-well of a um, so-called shaman. And that, uh, as far as we know, was probably what happened to the woman in our community. So your concern about safety, I think, is a very important part of this whole discussion. But I don't think it's so much a part of the question of whether ayahuasca properly prepared and working with someone who's uh, dedicated and had years of experience uh, in a safe surrounding is a viable um, oh, adjunct to our healing and awakening process. That safety piece is very much about how we in Western culture are going to come face to face with these whole other dimensions and these other kinds of medicine and decide whether we're really a free culture or not. And if we are, um, how to make it possible for people to have this kind of deep healing and, and these profound awakenings without having to worry that they're going to be taken advantage of. Uh, it's kind of like if you thought, well, the uh, Christian churches, uh, we can't regulate them, so we're gonna, not going to worry if there's some... Um, uh, scoundrel who calls himself a preacher and um, spikes the uh, communion brew with some sort of illicit chemical. Um, it's a political issue and it's one that needs to be addressed. Okay. Chris or, t Chris or Jonathan, I haven't heard from either of you in a while. I wanna, uh, either of you feel moved to say something? Well, I guess, yeah. Uh, if you work with psychedelics, or you, whether they're organic or synthetic psychedelics, uh, you have to pay a lot of attention and work very deeply with the energetic systems of the body. Um, and it's not just ayahuasca that has the purgative effect, but when the system begins to open up into deeper states of consciousness, by definition, deeper states of consciousness are higher energetic states of consciousness. And so there is a cycle of purification that takes place whenever you're opening into deeper states of consciousness, including using meditation as the driver for opening up into deeper states of consciousness. And there is a, a building up of energy and a catharsis sometimes and a letting go of that energy and, and throwing up or purging, uh, throwing out a lot of physical energy out of the body, throwing up a lot of emotional energy out of the emotional body, uh, a lot of mental constrictions out of the mental body. That's just, that, that's the nature of the game, I think. Whatever type Type of substances you're using if you're working therapeutically to fundamentally increase awareness of those basic blocks or obstructions. But I'd like to sort of shift the conversation a little bit and take it out of the personal realm because so far we're talking about personal blocks or ancestral blocks uh, with Jeffrey talking about his father. But you can open up into states of consciousness that are so profound you start working with uh, very, very large swaths of collective blocks. Mm. So the energy involved in those collective blocks is many orders of magnitude more intense and higher than working with personal blocks often. And so I just, I'm going to let go, but I just want to mention, since you mentioned something I had said, that uh, after working with psychedelics for many years, I wanted to step back because it was very demanding energetically. I just want to put that in context that that was after 20 years of work and very long sustained work working with very high doses of LSD even though I was working very conscientiously with a lot of attention to the physical body, a lot of attention to my energetic body, working with uh, Vajrayana practices before and after the psychedelic sessions itself when you move into deep, deep, enormously expanded states of consciousness, you're moving into profoundly different energetic realities. Those energetic realities are just an enormous exercise, uh, a challenge of integration, or even just managing the expansion and contraction process uh, through repeatedly through the years. So I think when it's done well, we don't really have to worry about... Uh, 
these substances causing uh, cracks, fissures, holes in the energetic body any more than, I mean, I think we develop holes in our energetic body by going to see some of the crap movies that many people go to see. So I don't think there are a singular cause of issues like that. Hmm. So, Who go ahead. Who? Yeah. yeah, Rick, I, I'd like to say, thanks, Chris. I, I really love what you had to say there. Um, in my journey, I was looking for what I call the ayahuasca silver bullet or mm -hmm. the miracle cure. And I see a lot of people kind of fall, I don't want to say fall victim to it, but put a little too much false hope into it. Oh, I have depression, I have anxiety, I have cancer. I'm going to go down, do a week or two dieta in ayahuasca, and come home healed. I did that twice, and it didn't work. I've done over 100 ceremonies, and it didn't work. And in my own journey, there was this whole question. We've talked a lot about ayahuasca, and I do want to just say, you know, we have MDMA and how they're treating Iraq war veterans therapeutically with that now with PTSD. Um, you know, people mentioned DMT, even ketamine, which I don't trust at all. Has some people have had really good experiences with that. Personally, my journey has been with cannabis, and I used to laugh at medical marijuana. I thought it was a joke. You know, like it was an excuse for people to smoke pot and eat Doritos and watch Cheech and Chong movies. <laughs> but after being really uh, disillusioned with ayahuasca and Santo Daime ceremonies, a hundred of them, I, and also the other spiritual practices, what I found was a fusion of them worked really well. We've been talking in either or language, which I doesn't resonate with me very well. Serious spiritual practices, psychedelic practices. My whole practice is a fusion of these. It's using cannabis. For me, cannabis slows things down enough and opens up the quantum field to then do deep yoga work, deep Tai Chi and Qigong work, energy healing. In fact, when I do energy healing work on people, I have a puke bucket. I, I, I smoke Santa Maria cannabis sometimes on special sessions. And you go deep into those systems. So I think we need to start having these dialogues. Rick, this is why I'm glad we're having this conversation because we can learn from each other. And what I learned in the coming year, I'm launching this whole Psychonaut training program because I've heard a lot of people talk about the brain and energy fields. We need to get psychedelic people in their bodies more. If you're having physical experiences, opening it up, you know, so that they can handle these intense states on their nervous system. So I'm interested in transformational programs. But Chris, I have seen to such a large degree things that I never would have believed in in the collective psyche held and constricted in the human energetic body, especially around wars, World War II, Holocaust. All of these things seem to be coming up a lot more in my healing practice and mm -hmm. man people are hitting the puke bucket more and more and lifting these things my hope is that both personally and collectively we can kind of illuminate our collective shadows and usher in kind of a more higher vibrational reality which Rack was kind of talking about the effects mm -hmm. of ayahuasca doing mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I think the collective psyche is being highly energized for a number of reasons now, and, and there is a tremendous purging that's taking place at a, at not only at individual levels, but at very deep collective levels, and it's just, it's coming out in all sorts of symptom clusters and all sorts of associated cleansing practices, but there's an enormous kind of release I think that we're pushing towards as we come to this critical tipping point in history because we're at a we're at a, a death and rebirth survival point you know we're, we're flirting with systemic uh, species extinction and that's an enormous evolutionary driver and that it touches all of us individually but it also touches the collective psyche of humanity collectively and if you work spiritually if you're working with contemplative practices or psychedelic practices or body discipline practices you are working against on, on the foundation of a, a tremendous activation of the collective psyche that's taking place Rock uh, dropped off the call I'm trying to get him back but um, he mentioned in his movie I believe it was the word Pachakuti, a great change is now upon the world in which everything will be turned right side up and harmony and order will be restored. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my book Dark Night Early Dawn uses this theme of the dark night of the soul, but it's really about the dark night of our collective soul. I think, you know, we are at this profound instability point. We're approaching a bifurcation point where, uh, you know, the, the physical and psychological consequences of um, thousands, tens of thousands of years of civilization based upon egoic consciousness, which is basically a, a you know fragmented consciousness, uh, that has produced a situation of a, a profoundly unstable and fractured and injured uh, world structure uh, and planetary ecological structure. We either uh, shift to a different register of consciousness. We either heal. Uh, the consequences of the ego's 10,000, thousands of years of history, 100,000 year history, or we perish. We have to take it to another level. And I think, in all, I think meditators encounter this, spiritually prayerful people encounter this, and psychedelic uh, uh, con, you know, spiritual people encounter this. Interesting. Uh, Jeffrey and Ciel and I used to be students of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and I remember him once saying, that someone asked him, well, what happens when you get rid of all the individual stress? You know, you've worked that all out. And he said, then you start working on cosmic stress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he, he was always fascinated with uh, collective consciousness and doing experiments in which you would take large groups of meditators and put them in a trouble spot such as Iran. I spent three months there just before the Shah mm -hmm. left. And seeing what effect their, their collective practice had on the uh, measurable statistics such as mm -hmm. war deaths or crime rates or you know, things like that, and, and mm -hmm. the principle being that there is, uh, um, Jeffrey lent me a book by uh, Stanislav Grof, and he had this little diagram of, which showed, like, individual consciousnesses, these little tiny nubs, and then, you know, then it was almost like a, a, a fractal, and then, and then bigger nubs, which would be like a family consciousness or a tribe mm -hmm. consciousness, and, you know, going down to the sort of a collective global consciousness, and I imagine we could even go out and think of solar system, galaxy, you know, clusters of galaxies, each having their own collective mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a reciprocal influence between uh, these larger sort of collective consciousnesses, if that's a plural, mm -hmm. and an individual. We, one can influence the other back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that is exactly what happens. It, it, the large influences the small, and the small con contributes to an influence uh, at the level of the large, morphic field dynamics. Mm -hmm. I, Rick, I've gotten into a wild study that's just throwing me for a loop, which is connecting to archetypal realms, to guides, like multidimensional reality, muses, and influences. I never believed in any of this stuff before, but now... I literally feel like there are spirits that come in and help guide that it's almost like fractal upon fractal and I'm starting to see maybe we are like little bits of a much larger organism and there's kind of an awakening to this deeper quantum reality that's happening and for me and what I'm hearing in a lot of psychedelic states is it's very quantum it's almost like sci-fi stuff but I do feel like there may be a great turning happening and psychedelics is one of the most powerful ways because if you're stuck in a rut, sometimes you need a little push. For me, it was I fought George Bush winning the second election, and he won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny, but I fell into a total dark night of the soul, and especially around the systematic species extinction. Three species an hour dying on this planet, and yet we're in this collective fog and sleep where you know everyone's still watching uh, you know what the Kardashians are doing and what I'm finding is like for me I I had a girlfriend at the time and she said you've been stressed out about this stuff you need to take some MDMA and get your butt on the dance floor I did that on my 30th birthday connected with community that was probably some of them were on psychedelic experiences this energy started rising in me and then poof I started seeing energy fields mm -hmm. and that made me start paying attention to religious systems across the planet and they all seem to be saying a similar thing. If it weren't for MDMA, uh, kind of pure ecstasy, I would have never gone on a spiritual path, perhaps. I, I may have never become a healer, never learned to meditate. So these things sometimes can turn people on a dime. I kind of have a joke that I say that most atheists I know are one or two cups away uh, of ayahuasca away from a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, back in the '60s, that's definitely what got a, a lot, you know, gave a lot of us our start. 
and I'm sure it's happening today. Um, I mean, that was su it was such an eye opener for me the first time I took LSD. It was like holy crap, there, there's, it, everything depends upon how you perceive the world. That had never occurred to me. I always just assumed that everybody perceived the world the same way. You know? And uh, so, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, some of us do need a good swift kick in the pants. I still do. Yeah. And incidentally, uh, and, and Rack is back, by the way. We he dropped off the call for a bit. Um, this thing you say about archetypal image or entities and so on that you're experiencing. Um, all of you touch upon this in, in your various writings and works and, and, and you know Stanislav Grof talks a lot about it in his book but there are realms and realms and realms, uh, subtle realms uh, with all sorts of intelligent forms of life and um, I have friends who perceive this stuff, who've never taken a drug in their lives, who perceive these beings as routinely as you and I see people at the mall. Uh, you know, it's just part of their everyday reality. But it's, and so, you know, some people would say, well, that's just a distraction. You really want to get down to the non-dual essence of things. And that's, that's where you should establish yourself. Yeah, but once that's established, or perhaps even before that's established, but especially once that's established, okay, what next? What next is exploration of all the subtle realms of creation and, and discovering what's there and what advantage can be had by, by familiarity with those. Yeah, which for me, this raises an issue of the relationship between working conscientiously, therapeutically, spiritually with psychedelics and uh, enlightenment. I know that I began my work uh, basically seeking enlightenment and willing to confront the shadow more aggressively working with psychedelics in order to uh, hasten the blossoming of enlightenment. But over time, over the years, I began to realize that there was a lot going on in my work that really wasn't concerned with enlightenment at all. And conversely, you don't need to engage the archetypal dimensions. You do not need to, you know, transcend time completely. You do not need to go into these radical expansions of consciousness in order to open to the transparent, uh, non-dual ground of reality. So I think it's an ongoing question of what the shamanic and neo-shamanic path, the relationship of those journeys and dynamics is to enlightenment itself. And again, I, I agree that these are, I think these are a synchronous phenomenon. I mean, I, I've never been working only in one or the other. I've always been working in contemplative practices <clears throat> and householder practices of raising children and, you know, teaching and whatnot and psychedelic practices, so it's, it's not an either-or for me, but it is an open question of, of if the goal is enlightenment, what's the most effective way to work with psychedelics to facilitate that goal? But there are other goals other than enlightenment that emerge, I think, in the psychedelic journey. Mm. Just to throw in one quick comment, because I've been talking a bit more than I want to, because there's so many of you I want you to all say more, but um, just to quote Maharishi again, since several of us have, were his students, he often used the analogy of capture the fort, and what he meant by that was uh, that life is like a territory, and there's a fort that commands the territory, and that fort is the transcendent, the ultimate ground of being, and that you should strive to capture that first, because if you go exploring the territory without having captured it, exploring this diamond mine or this gold mine or whatever, it's not really your territory. And so you're kind of on shaky ground. And also, you're, since you're not in a position to command the whole territory, you're just kind of grasping at straws. You're getting this sort of piecemeal bit ex exploration without having uh, discovered that which provides the benefit of all explorations, you know, the sort of source and goal of all, of all creation. Uh, so I, what you said, Chris, just reminded me of that analogy. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of, if one can do that, it sort of puts things in a proper perspective or orientation. And without having done that, it would seem to me that one could spend lifetimes exploring all sorts of mm -hmm. subtle strata of creation without really ultimately knowing, you know, the, the ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think there's some really good points here. I think you know we we're talking about the elephant in the room before. It's like well, you know, there are definitions for this, and I know a lot of your listeners are probably engaged with this in the meditative practices of what is enlightenment. 
Um, one thing that I think sort of catalyzes for me in this in this work with entheogens like ayahuasca and even well, there, there's a whole there's a whole planetary uh, you know smorgasbord of substances which the planet secretes. There's a there's a Terence McKenna had this riff, who's a psychedelic philosopher, and he was actually quoting another 1960s um, uh, personality, Bear Owsley, who both had these intuitions from psychedelics that the entheogens specifically are secreted by the planet to connect with us. You know, they create pathways, they're all over the planet. Um, each landscape has within it an energetic sort of vibration and it produces a certain plant entheogen. Um, Bear Owsley called these things planetary exopheromones. He was saying that they're, they're produced by the planet who loves and nurtures us and wants to connect us to these substances for a very specific role in our evolution. It's like you know when you're a teenager and you go through puberty, is that these fer pheromones um, course through your body and, and all these different catalyzing changes happen and they happen at a certain stage in your evolution for a reason, because it's built in. And so the planet doesn't really make mistakes. It does evolutionary uh, vectors where it tries out different species. But the thing we must remember, and, and one of the great things I, I've, I've learned from my entheogenic and psychedelic experiences, is a, a real non-linear perception of reality and how to basically grok or have a deeper appreciation for um, you know, a non-linear framework where then everything interpenetrates and affects and is in a causal relationship with everything else. Like everything affects, we're all connected. And so the planet, in its connection to us, is producing these substances, which you know the Western war on drugs started by Richard Nixon in 1971, is really you know commodifying into its agenda. But the planet is secreting these things, which has a direct effect with us. Medicine people across the planet have retained this knowledge and retained these portals to these larger states of awareness. But are these states of awareness enlightenment? Not necessarily. What they can open up are pathways for hyperdimensionality, pathways for an appreciation that the life force permeates higher dimensions. Um, we can see these entities we described before. We can recognize and uh, journey into dimensions, vast dimensions of energy and of being, and realize there is basically what I call a galactic ecology. There is you know, life all around us in inner space and in outer space. And some of these uh, these substances can bring us back to this awareness. So this idea of these substances as um, planetary exopheromones, or you know, I, I look at them as almost training wheels. That at some stage in our evolutionary history, I think we've all had the sensitivity of a vibrational sensitivity to engage with the larger dimensionality around us. But as we've come into the last 6,000 years of his story of agriculture and of industrialization of cities of EMF. We've basically been eroding and declining from our, our full energetic potential. So at this point, you know, nature's giving us these substances as reminders and as healing agents to cleanse, to regain our own ability to, you know, the Buddha lies within or to be enlightened or these types of phrases we might say. But is it real enlightenment? I think it's actually just remembering that these potentials exist and then eventually Eventually, when we have regained this ability as a species, we don't need the substances. These are stepping stones. These are training wheels the planet is guiding us very carefully and gently to say, remember, 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 you can do this yourself. And whether that means stepping up to, you know, the Curanderos in Peru, so there's all these hyper dimensions, there's these levels of the ayahuasca experiences, you go deep into what I call the Godhead, you know, and the, the Sufi mystics called the Godhead. Um, but we can travel into these spaces, but you know we can bring something back, whether that's an entity, a good or a bad thing, or the knowledge of these these realms, and we can perhaps map these realms, and we can be explorers for our species. But ultimately, I think there's going to be a tipping point where, as a species, we regain the ability to navigate and to operate as galactic beings or hyperdimensional beings, um, and then we don't need these plants. We we basically have the ability within ourselves. Beautiful. Jeffrey Asiel, I haven't heard, haven't heard from you lately. Say anything? Um, I, yeah, I just, you know, this whole subject about ayahuasca and plant medicines and awakening and enlightenment. We've had the great fortune in Peru to work with one young medicine man who is native to Peru, to the Andes, and he also has experienced with some of the plant helpers there, mostly with um, San Pedro cactus that grows in the Andes regions and a little bit of with ayahuasca, although he does not himself lead ayahuasca ceremonies. But and so here we come from this 
long-term background in transcendental meditation and this desire for enlightenment. And with him, it was curious. It took me many times of being with this man to realize that we were um, ultimately talking about the same thing. He just didn't call it awakening or enlightenment. It wasn't like an attainment for him because in that culture, it's as if being one with the Creator is just a given. You just expect that you're one with the Creator. You know what creation is all about, and you know what it is to be one with. I mean, Jeffrey and I were floored one time taking a walk with someone. We were actually kind of being babysat by, by someone. Like someone, someone we were going to do business with was busy and said, said to her, her uncle, take them for a walk. And so we went on this walk, and we kept being asked again and again by this uncle who didn't speak almost any um, Spanish even, let alone English, would we like to rest? Would we like to sit down and rest? And we kept saying no, like, yeah, we're gringos, but we don't need to rest. We can keep walking. And finally, after about the fourth time, he said, the energy by this river is so good. We should sit and meditate to take in the energy of the river. He just was using the word let's rest, but what he had to explain to us that we didn't know was let's connect to the energy that's here, that's present, if we can pause and connect with it. So there are certain parts of their life about being one with Creator, being one with Spirit, being one with the Pachamama, the basis of all of the world we live on, that is just part of their culture. So they don't talk about awakening or enlightenment. Because it's kind of like, it's like talk about breathing, of course we breathe. Of course we're awake to who we are essentially, and of course we have a connection to the divine. And so, you know, it took us a while to realize, to find someone who spoke English well enough, and to listen to him deeply enough over extended interviews and conversations to realize that a lot of this work with the plants is just about bringing more life to us, more and more life experience to us, and bring it being it's all that we are. You know, just like I think that analogy that you were making, Rick, of first owning the territory, really owning it before you go and explore the different glories of your territory. Well, a lot of people that we're meeting in Peru, the Curanderos, are already owning the territory. So much that they don't even talk about it. It's a given. Mm -hmm. And they are exploring the territories using things like San Pedro mm -hmm. Cactus, using things like um, ayahuasca, and other plants, and other forms of meditation to explore all of the realms of creation that are available to us. Mm -hmm. So I don't, they don't seem to separate the two. I mean, it's so part of them, but they don't even separate them out to talk about them because it's just who they are. Cool. Jonathan, were you about to... Oh, uh, Jeffrey, you, you have something? Well, I mean, the, the other overlap is between uh, healing and awakening or uh, purification and enlightenment. Um, there is a sense in which the only thing that prevents us from recognizing our true nature is all of the, and I, I guess I'll say ego structures, but the, the, the kind of coping that we create uh, in response to trauma, whether it's um, young in this lifetime or whether it's perinatal or whether it's um, collective unconscious, um, we are always fortifying ourselves against that. And this process of purification or cleansing or healing, just by allowing us to release those, is really the same process of opening or coming into an enlightened or awakened state. It's, they're really just two ways of looking at the same process. So um, I happen to feel like for most folks, uh, that's what's really showing up. And, and I don't have any quarrel with the notion that some of us ought to be doing these uh, explorations. And, and uh, in fact, I really um, think, yeah, that, that should be uh, one of the um, occupations that we try to find more and more people to do. Um, I also think that the shift in the collective consciousness gets supported by each individual who um, releases whatever holds him or her back, steps into what is really that person's soul's calling, and gets grounded, gets that connection with wholeness or spirit, 
um, in the process. Once that old stuff is out of the way, then yeah, the uh, the energy by that stream or the energy by the stream where we live um, suddenly shows up for us. It was always there. We were always clouded um, by the old compensations that we've been uh, making and clinging to. Um, in Rock's movie, he, he quoted a Sufi saying and that there are 50,000 veils of illusion between you and God, but none between God and you. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So it's all here, you know. Uh, it's just a matter of removing the veils. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone? I mean, I, I'd like to speak on this a little bit, Rick, because I feel like I've gone on a journey with this. Um, as far as exploring these realms and the enlightenment, uh, I mean, personally, what, what we just heard about, like, defense systems for abuse or gr trauma growing up, I did that a lot, and I just withdrew is the bioenergetic defense I did. I escaped my body, uh, not really being present, and, and the world was very theoretical for me. It was a concept. It was an idea. It wasn't a living, breathing being. And through the work of uh, ayahuasca and cannabis and these things, I started understanding the chakra systems more and how you know each power center, whether you know, and there's different modalities, relates to a different element. You know, you have an earth element, you have a water element, you have a fire element, and these are all waves of existence. You know, an earthquake wave is very different than a water wave, and I just started really noticing the elemental journey an interbeing of the elements and myself is having all the elements within me and suddenly through this process the magic of the universe actually just started opening up I saw life everywhere you know LeBrock was talking about this galactic life perspective but I don't know I, in some ways I feel like we're going through an initiatory process of the elements like in a lot of yogis think we're kind of in this third chakra element um, which is a fire element we've gone through earth and water and it's the elements of civilization and I'm just kind of watching a World War II documentary which I think is a huge collective demon for us and it, it ushered in the atomic age and a lot of yogis now are like that destructive power you know I was watching a, the mushroom bomb on this video uh, hitting Hiroshima and it first looked like a mushroom and then I saw this giant gorgeous toxic disgusting tree of life and I was thinking of how that atomic power of that third chakra the fire center may be pushing us as I hear a lot of yogis and spiritual people talking into this heart center which then opens up the upper power centers to more of a spiritual reality and then I suddenly started after atomic energy was studying the, the unified field theories theories of how there's these energies you were talking about God being out there that we're already connected with and I personally think this might be one of the most revolutionary things that's happening if it is happening. It's like discovering fire, that there's this fire within us, this God power within and without. It, and it may totally revolutionize spirituality, the energy, um, how we collectively organize ourselves, finding our own autonomous so sovereignty, and even kind of healing this disease of separation and scarcity that I think has cause so much grasping and uh, suffering on the planet. I mean, it's a little bit of a wild theory, but all of these things in this incredible journey through the elements has, through psychedelics has brought me to some realizations. And maybe most importantly, what it brought me to is just feeling more like an initiated man instead of like an angry boy-child teenager. <laughs> Suddenly, it's, it's very exciting to be like a male... Hum, homo sapien on this planet at this extraordinary time realizing it's all up for grabs and everything dies and is reborn so I don't know it's weird by going so far out I feel like I'm much more human and grounded than I've ever been before mm -hmm. cool anyone okay everybody's good at the moment um, well what, one theme we've been talking about I think um, you were off the line, uh, Rock, when I read the, the word Panchakuti from your movie, A Great Change is Now Upon the World in Which Everything Will Be Turned Right Side Up and Harmony and Order Will Be Restored. Um, I, uh, 
interviewed Llewellyn Von Lee a few a couple months ago, and he's written a book which is a little pessimistic. He 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 almost seems to feel that we're not going to make it. Uh, it's uh, he's called the darkening of the light or something like that. I've got it on the shelf back there, but um, my hope is that just as we have the the notion of a tipping point in in the climate change discussion, beyond which it'll be impossible to reverse the the runaway global warming, um, we may be on the brink of a tipping point in um, spiritual evolution for the world, uh, which we could be very close to without even knowing it. Because generally, when phase transitions happen, they're not evident until they have happened. Like even the boiling of water, you know, it can be almost 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but it doesn't look any different than if it were, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But then, as soon as it reaches the boiling point, it starts turning to steam. So, you know, uh, Rock was talking about um, all the plants that are being like offered by, you know, Mother Nature, Mother Earth, um, as methods of uh, facilitating our evolution. Um, it may be, I'm hoping, and we'll get your responses to this, that um, there's a, that the response to environmental degradation and and you know mass extinction of species, which Talat talked about a little earlier, um, is being met by the acceleration of human consciousness, the raising of consciousness, and that uh, all sorts of uh, unseen intelligence is facilitating this and, and promoting it, which is why, from my perspective, as somebody who has interviewed a couple hundred people, uh, there are spiritual awakenings happening like popcorn all over the world with apparently greater and greater um, uh, frequency. Uh, and we, you know, again, speaking of nuclear fusion, which, you know, Talat just referred to, uh, there's a certain point at which it, takes off and you have the the atomic explosion um, uh, hopefully there's something akin to that happening with spiritual development on the planet well I think so to jump in um, it, it's, it's really interesting what you point out why why does there seem to be you know this um, this tipping point in spirituality and, and mass awakening or at least hunger for mass awakening with many many people within not just the spiritual community, but as more and more people within the mainstream, through different modalities, all encounter spirit in some form. I was talking right at the start, I guess, about this supply and demand and this uh, um, this sort of uh, denuding of our relationship with spirit in Western culture over, over the, the centuries. Um, you know, you talked about the Pachacuti and this idea. Many cultures have, or pretty much all indigenous cultures, tribal cultures which have lived on the earth, and understand cycles and seasonal cycles and greater cycles have you know different um, calendricals or different mythologies that point to the fact that there's different world ages in larger uh, larger blocks of time. There seems to be almost like cosmic seasons that we go through, where there's different energies within those within those blocks of time. And so we've just come through a grand conclusion in the uh, the Mayan calendar back in 2012. And, you know, it wasn't just that it was 2012, that point, that one target window on December 21st, 2012. It was actually a grand cycle that came to uh, one level of completion and a new cycle begun. Uh, so, you know, different cultures say it's the Kali Yuga or it's the new cycle of this or the new paradigms coming through. But everyone seems to feel that, you know, we have been going through in his story, we have been going through this process um, of transformation in, in, in history itself and in through global culture, metastatizing into global culture. And we can sort of see all these different streams all paralleling and pooling together now at this point in time. Here we are on Google Hangouts all across the world, you know, all linked up in this, this hive mind. And the ability for people, at least in, in Western countries who have the, the resources, to connect has never been greater. So this idea of can we, you know, is there is there an impetuous behind that? Is there some type of um, is there some type of energy which is building us to to this point? I, I believe is true. And in my movie I Are Awakenings, I quote some of the indigenous prophecies, and I see that this this reemergence of the shamanic paradigm and this reacquaintanceship with nature herself, with uh, with uh, Pachamama or with Mother Nature herself, 
is all part and parcel of the process. And so as we as we are groomed back into this awareness of our own spirituality, of our own energy bodies, of how we connect to nature and the energy in nature, we will eventually find those of us who have had contact experiences with nature herself that it feels to me that there's definitely an entity. Sometimes it's loving, sometimes it's harsh. I mean, you know, it's, it's a true parent. There's a larger there's a larger intelligence, I feel, whether we call that Matakwiasan or Great Spirit or Pachamama or, you know, whatever label we give it, there is a, is a larger intelligence from my experiences um, that is behind all this planetary activity and behind the plants and behind us ourselves as well. And so just... I mean, you know, just at the, the moment on the planet to have so many people who have the ability to communicate their own experiences like we are now and to share and to pull their own experiences and to remember that no one path is true for another person, that all of these experiences we're describing, whether it's ayahuasca or psychedelics or meditation, you know, or alien abduction, whatever, is that all pathways are valid and all paths lead to God or whatever label you choose to give it um, in the end. And that, that I feel we're being nurtured. It's like when you pan for gold in, in the old days, it's like you have to sift through the sand and you have to, it gradiates the soul and eventually the right vibrations reach and everyone finds their own right pathway. But there is a collective awakening happening as we come full circle. My shorthand for this is that we're, we've basically been going through a long periods of history where it's like when you're on a mobile phone and uh, you lose reception. You go down from a four bar signal to one or two bars and it gets a bit fuzzy. It's like we've been we've not been receiving you know the right signal from source, and so my, my shorthand is that we're getting four bar galactic signal now. We're getting it's coming through because we're cusping over into this new um, well geophysical sort of uh, uh, pattern where we're we're lining up in a different alignment with the the center of the galaxy and the Milky Way and all of the the astrophysics to it. But also there's this energy coming in animating things, and we're getting more. We're getting a larger signal. And it's animating. And it's like when um, when you're out camping or something, and you know the sun comes over the horizon, and and the day starts, and the animals wake, and then you feel that heat, and you can't remain asleep any longer because it's getting hot. Something is happening, and energy is coming in, and it's activating. And so this is why I feel the the plants are working for the planet, and they all have a plan. And it's basically to find our own pathways to to um, awareness because this energy is coming in. And the more we can be cleansed through whatever modality you choose, the more signal we can receive. And the more signal we can receive collectively, we form a species circuit to hold that energy and to anchor it on Earth and anchor it not just for our species, but in the web of life. You know, if you hear the insects in the morning, they, they send off this cascading signal through the ecosystem where the insects will... Uh, will wake up or they'll, they'll switch on other insects and then the frogs and the amphibians and then the higher level of animals. And nature herself speaks through all the species at once, not just the humans. And so as this energy comes through and animates and, and sort of expresses itself, it cascades and it activates all the other species because collectively we form an interspecies symbiosis and a group circuit to hold the energy coming down and that awakening isn't just that we're, we're, we're there, we're awake, we're going, what do we do next? We have a role to play you know, on the planet as the planet, as the collective intelligence of the planet to hold the energy coming in you know, and then to express that, however that is. And that is the, the cusping into the new paradigm, which we'll have to do it when it happens, and it's happening. Beautiful. I can see why you're a journalist. You're so articulate with this stuff. It's a joy to listen to you. Thank you. Rick, I wanted to say a little bit about this Pacha Kuti word that you threw out. And so Pacha, in just the most simple definition of Pacha, is just time and space. And then Kuti is just a turning over. So again, it's just a turning over of our time and space continuum. But people, it's a, it's a proving word, a catch a word. And it's just, so the people, especially in the high Andes in, in Peru, their, their culture was telling them around the turn of the 20th century was going to be the next Pachacuti, the next turning over. And one thing that they noticed in that turning over, they don't necessarily know that it's going, what, it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but things are going to be turned over. And they particularly started noticing their glaciers melting at a place where they, there's going to be melting every year, but there shouldn't be continual receding year after year after year after year so that their, the glaciers are not, because that's what's going to... Um, bring them their next harvest, you know, with the snow melt. And they started noticing them 
receding at an alarming rate. So without any TVs or any anyone telling them about global warming, they could see the effects that were happening, and they thought this is the sign of this catastrophe. We need to do something so that this change can be um, held by the collective in a way that will bring us all forward in life. And so one thing that they started doing amongst themselves talking was what can we send to the rest of the world? Like what can we, you know, kind of a gift to the rest of the world that can help the whole world through this change? And they, the people from Carlos, at least in the high Andes near Cusco, um, put together with some help of some Westerners a series of initiations to help each of us become more fully present who we are. So for instance, that one of these initiations is to initiate healing, both for ourselves and others. Another is open up with the third eye, and especially that, well, the third eye and connect to the heart, that kind of vision that comes through those. Another one is to balance all of the chakras. So there's this, these series of initiations. The culmination one is what they call either the creator or the spirit rights. Again, to connect us to source, that they have this thought is you're not going to very well connect to source unless there's a lot of balance and empowerment within your physiology to begin with. So there's a series of initiations. And this series, though, of these harpies or empowerments were freely given to the people not of South America to give to the people of the world. They're kind of like rescue mission when there's a big tsunami that hits someplace. We all rush in with medical supplies and fresh water and healing, you know, hands, medical hands. Well, they were going to rush to us by training as many of us as possible to give these particular initiations, especially towards that healer right, I mean, excuse me, that, that creator right, spirit right, to bring us all into harmony with spirit, with source, so that we can ride this wave of Pachacuti with awareness, with integrity. I love when, when um, that idea of these, um, you know, athletes, like these surfers that are riding these waves for the power that it gives them. Sure, those waves are dangerous, but if we can ride them with sensitivity and awareness, we become empowered by their energy. So the same way we can ride this Kachikuti by being very adept at having a fully integrated physiology and connected to source. So anyway, just it's, it's a very, it's a word that you will hear there. It's taken very seriously, this turning over. But they don't just aren't passive, like, well, what are we going to do? Life is turning over. No, let's go connect to source and be as full as we can be, so we can all collectively ride this way for the power it can bring to us, not for the destruction it could also bring to us. Interesting. Uh, I'll just throw in one quick thing and then let somebody else respond. But um, this, this image of riding the wave, you know, you can't ride the wave unless you catch the wave. Beach Boys wrote a song called Catch a Wave. But um, if you don't catch the wave, then I guess you can get clobbered by the next wave or you have to wait for the next wave. But in, in the case of this metaphor, uh, I wonder if there will be multiple waves which people can catch or if there is just basically one huge wave that, you know, um, we should attempt to catch or else we're going to get swept up in the undercurrent. Some, some prophecies and so on say that it's not going to be a pretty picture for the vast majority of humanity and that only those who've prepared themselves adequately will really flourish and others will go through a real hard time of it. Anyone have any comments on that? Uh, I'll throw in. I'm really comfortable with what CL has said and what Rack has said in describing the dynamics that we've entered into and are entering into. Um, and I'm, I think if you work in any self-conscious spiritual practice, including psychedelics, one makes contact with the, the, the fundamental intelligence and intelligences that are driving the evolutionary process. So that this pro crisis that we've entered into is being driven by a cosmic intelligence, I personally don't doubt. But it's a very fierce intelligence. I mean, in the, Hin in the Upanishadic scriptures, it says, she eats her children. Life eats life. So the fact that it's compassionate and the compassion of oneness and the fact that it's intelligent and the fact that it's extending us countless invitations to learn and grow and, and become more fully what we already are in essence, that doesn't mean that we won't go extinct in the process because 
you know, we're extinguishing life on this planet faster than any time since the the uh, the, the meteor that took out the dinosaurs hit. Uh, so we may not have the right to this planet if we're willing to allow, if not cause, the extinction of life at the pace that we are. I mean, among my circle and people who are very conscientious students of global patterns, I'd have to say that there's a 50-50 a very educated 50-50 assessment of whether humanity is going to go extinct in this process. I come down on the positive side, but it's not because of the data. Uh, it's really the only thing I rooted in ultimately is my own visionary experience. But I think, I don't think we're going to change deeply enough at the soul and at the collective level without an enormous amount of pain in the process. I mean, we're going to, many estimates are placing the carrying capacity of the planet of the new earth, which means the eco-compromised earth, at somewhere between a billion and two billion people. We're going to hit nine billion by 2025. So between one or two billion and nine billion, that's a die-off of potentially seven billion people. The ordeal that, that's mounting in the 21st century, the ordeal of loss of that many of our children is just going to be painful beyond our, our imagination right now. Uh, I think it's my concern is not whether we make it. I believe deeply that we will make it. My concern is more how many of our children are going to die before we make it, before we wake up. The faster we wake up, the faster we cooperate with this process the fewer of our children will have to die and the strength the strength the stronger we will be as a species coming out of it but we could cripple ourselves even if we make it we could cripple the species so badly it could take us 500 years to recuperate and get our feet back underneath us our survival feet back underneath us Chris, I, to jump in there i think that's all very true and one of the things that i see happening in um a lot of the global movements at the moment is that even people who are embracing change and are wanting to get back to sustainability and lower emissions, everyone's still trying to basically retrofit the existing paradigm. And even talking about 9 billion people or 2 billion people, we're all still on the same playing field there. And what, what I see happening is what I think Jonathan mentioned before is that this is basically an initiation. It's a global initiation. It's a planetary initiation. It's a cosmic initiation. And we must remember that, you know, whether we call it, Pachu, uh, call it uh, Pachamama or, or Gaia or planet Earth, whatever the intelligence in nature is, as you said as well, as that she, to call it a she, she, um, she can be ruthless. And she, she is so with the species. And all the species are actually just clothes that she wears. You know, it, it, in some senses, it, it does and it doesn't matter that the, 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 the form that we take is just the outside, you know, manifestation. It's the it's the level of the soul vibration or the intellect or the intelligence, and how that inter interacts and interlocks with with the need on the ground. That there's a process underway when we're talking about these world ages and this crisis that we're facing. There's a process of transformation, and so I think you know the big call to action here is to go with the flow. You know, as the as the I think it's the Hopi saying that says that the river is running very fast now. Like, don't hold on. Don't try to hold on to the existing paradigm, basically, they're saying. Go with the flow and see where it takes you. And that may mean a, not just a, like a paradigm change in terms of how we operate as a civilization, but I would hope how we operate as a species and on a, you know, on a cellular level. As we've seen through different scientific analysis of, um, of historical time and they've done deep core analysis of the ice and they've seen different cosmic ray bombardments and different isotypes in the ice that have been affected by that. They can tell energetically what's been happening over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. We're now being bombarded yet again by intense cosmic ray activity from you know, a solar system sort of level and a deep galactic and a universal level. And there's, there's cascading changes which are meant to be happening on, a, on an evolutionary level. The whole wave of evolution is to change and to change not just to retrofit little bits here and there and have a two billion strong civilization that's sort of the same on the other side, um, it's to basically change on a, on a spirit level. So your body might change, the whole shape of your, of your vehicle as you go through the world might change, but it's the soul which has to be strong to survive these coming times. And it needs us. I, I believe that the, all of these mini initiations are happening to gird ourselves and to strengthen our soul bodies to be able to 
intake the coming energy and to do whatever is naturally meant to happen. We know that our bodies are you know, 70 to 90% water and they're electromagnetic vehicles. Um, energy is coming in and it's meant to be activating the DNA. The DNA is programmed by the light and by the energy coming in. And we have to trust in evolution, but we also have to be strong enough to be these vehicles for evolution that it's asking us to be. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I watched, as I mentioned, I watched World War II movies, uh, World War II in Color, which is an amazing 13-point documentary, and there's just this frustration when it starts of everyone's waiting. The Nazis are building, this is happening, no one's doing anything, and it's appeasement, 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 da, 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 and I just felt like that's us. We're in this monochrome, mm -hmm. monoculture, and it feels like we're all talking about civilization. You know, the first civilization in Mesopotamia totally collapsed because they over they irrigated, they oversalted the rivers. And I think we're looking at a ten thousand year journey in civilization that looks like on the verge of collapse. And what really struck me is once they finally got the message, and it would have been a lot easier if they had acted a lot earlier, is the amount of alliances, innovation, creativity, dy dynamics. Like they were trying to fight Hitler in this, these kind of dark forces, you might say, with the old paradigm, World War I mentality. So you, you can't fight a blitzkrieg this way. I think we are looking at a planetary blitzkrieg as far mm -hmm. as economics and climate change and species. It's on. And it's not, people aren't getting it yet. Maybe the blitzkrieg has to get stronger. But what did Im inspire me was how seemingly impossible forces could be overcome with collaborations, with innovations, with human ingenuity, spirit. And, you know, Winston Churchill, it's weird. He became this weird kind of mentor for me in a way of how do you stand up to the darkness when it seems so hopeless? How do you have patience and firmness to have hope knowing it could take years? This may take generations, but I kind of feel like everyone listening, let's activate whatever not to scramble, not to struggle. I feel like we see a lot of scrambling going on in the news, a lot of trying quick fixes and things like that, but to step up and hear, heed the call to a very deep journey and what I feel is perhaps spiritual warriorship. I, I never thought my healings would be about hunting, but when I do energy healings, it's very much about being on the aggressive going in for the attack to meet the shadow and confront it to then help it transform. It's, it's kind of a journey of love and it's almost like a war of love and reunification. But I had a very kind of lazy universe heal me way. And I think it, it fits in with the surfing metaphor very well is you've got to get your board, you've got to learn, you've got to train if you want to ride these waves. And I feel like we all, like the call is here for us to find our empower find our power, find our gifts, get creative, and really collaborate with each other and create new systems of creativity and collaboration that value innovation, individual and community spirit at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I really think we need a miracle, and we have a very lazy idea of miracles. You know, you pray, you do this. For me, my miracle, my healing practice was like the John Elway touchdown drive in 1985 or whatever. <laughs> against the Cleveland Browns. It was like on the two line yard line working with the team step by step by step and then finally after years punching it through the end zone. And I kind of think that's the kind of miracle we have to co-manifest together. Well, there is the David and Goliath story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and speaking of Winston Churchill, he, he said, um, America always does the right thing after trying every other alternative. <laughs> 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 so this hope, but this is fascinating stuff. I mean, we we um, we can milk this for a bit more, perhaps. Uh, I I don't think too many of my interviews have touched upon this theme as much as this one is. Just you know, the fate of the Earth and and what's going on and what higher energies there might be that are influencing it and. And all it's 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 interesting that this conversation has morphed in that direction. May I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. I, I think in some ways that's kind of one of the natural uh, derivatives or consequences of working with this with sacred medicines because uh, 
I mean, the contemplative practices do shift you into dramatically different states of consciousness, but they often work with within the kind of near at hand states of consciousness because the purpose, I think, as I might summarize it quickly, is that you know the the clarification of consciousness until the very nature of awareness shines through unobstructed. Uh, sacred medicines shift you is concerned with that as well, but they also shift you into very radically expanded states of consciousness in, in which one begins to uh, experience not only larger fields of awareness, but drop into the evolutionary patterns that hold your life and hold your time in history and hold in patterns of the evolutionary structure so that individuals repeatedly in working with sacred medicines learn that, you know, it's not a personal story. You know, the story of, of Earth is not a personal story, and the story of evolution, the story of enlightenment and spiritual awakening is not a personal story. And right now, the that species of which we are a part and the planet of which we are a part is coming into this crisis time. It's the very nature of psychedelics that it dramatically and radically expands our frame of reference with it, from within we understand our own life process itself. There are some drawbacks of working with these dramatically expanded states and there are some advantages. But one of the advantages, I think, is that it has sensitized many of us uh, to an accelerated appreciation of the forces that are driving society and culture and history at this point in the 21st century. Hmm. And as no. we're, uh, I'm sorry, who was, who was about to speak? I was going to say, and that's one of the reasons why they're illegal, I think. So, you know, the consciousness expansion creates individuals who are, you know, aware of awareness, let, let's say. It's like it becomes a lot harder to create sheeple and people who are easily led into, into the, uh, the, the battery farm paradigm where we're inhabiting in uh, 21st century Earth when you do expand consciousness and when you see outside the box and you want to connect with others and be an evolutionary agent. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. which then throws the question back in the direction of traditional practice you know what is the what is the purpose of traditional contemplative practice or practice which is focused on awakening in any kind of classical sense I mean the image of the Buddha at the gas pump well we're at past peak oil now you know, <laughs> it's almost the image is historically contextualized so what is the purpose what's the relationship of traditional spiritual practice and the evolutionary crisis that we're all part of in this time in history. That's such a good question. Hey, I'll just have thrown to that as well. You know, what, what some some of the things which deeply sadden me when I, I look at the news are the situation in places like Tibet, where there's political oppression and there's um, very spiritual people, the meditative community, the the, the, the monks and the uh, the Buddhists of, of, of Tibet, who are basically, you know. Uh, self-immolating themselves and setting themselves on fire in, in, in protest and in, in, in a cry to the world to say things are that bad on the ground politically and the oppression of their feeling as a community that these people who have presumably vows of, uh, you know, life-affirming vows not to kill and, and things like that are actually taking their lives as a, as a human sacrifice to publicize the events. And so, you know what you were saying, Chris, about uh, what what value can can these uh, these established spiritual communities have, and how do we sort of counteract this uh, this this feeling, I guess, of great oppression in the world, whether that's from the banksters and the financial systems, or, or government and you know totalitarian regimes. Um, spiritual practices alone can can raise our awareness and can open us up. But then there needs to be more uh, practical uh, on the ground solidarity between not just awakened people, but everyone who can hear the, uh, the cry of people in need like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we see that in engaged Buddhism. You know, the whole movement within Buddhism, that it, it, Buddhism isn't simply about awakening in some psycho-spiritual sense, but it's an awakening within a social sense. It's awakening within a, a larger contextual historical sense. And if that's missing from it, then that's that's a basically that's a missing a fundamental theme of uh, enlightenment cultures, but I think also awakening has different connotations today than it did two thousand years ago. You know the context is different. Uh, we truly need not only we need a, a green Buddha. We not only need a feminist Buddha. We need a 
we need a Buddha Gaya. We, we need to sort of contextualize our practice. Whatever drivers we're using in our practice, we need to contextualize it within our moment of history. This is our moment of history. Hmm. One thing is that, uh, you know, it often seems that the politicians, the corporations, the bankers, and so on, wield all the power, and, and spiritual people are relatively uninfluential. Um, but if spiritual people are really um, learning to operate at subtle realms of creation, we know from you know the examples in physics that subtler realms are more powerful, and um, mm -hmm. perhaps you know really uh, perhaps the spiritual folks are the ones who really have the ultimate leverage. Mm -hmm. could, could I make a suggestion here too, or a, there's just a thought, because you know, I brought up the surfing metaphor, especially big wave surfers, and it was a big deal when they, first of all, the first person to discover a surfboard and figure out you could do this, that was, I think it was kind of an evolutionary force on the planet of like, oh, this is a way to integrate adrenaline and things into the human s psyche and spirit. And then they figured out they could surf Waimea, but then they were stuck because technology didn't keep up until they figured out, wait a second, we can pull boards out on toes and hit giant waves. And so in some ways, this kind of 10,000-year division between science and spirituality, like you guys are saying spirituality, and it's not resonating with me that well because for me, spirituality is kind of up and out and not here in that way. I'm very interested of like how is the new consciousness and you know I think Chris was suggesting this the technologies meeting each other and I think we can amplify evolution through responsible use of technologies I mean I'm already seeing this in the economic models I Airbnb my apartment I use Lyft taxi services I have all these friends that we're, we're creating alternative economies through these things and I really am looking forward to when the medical institutions discover the energy fields. And then finally we will have intuitives and scientists meeting because I really think like some of the parasitic quantum stuff, we could be reading it on frequency readers and things like that and stuff that like took, we thought was uncurable, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia can be illuminated through the field through consciousness and the synthesis of consciousness and advanced technology. And what happens is when you have people feeling better, they're empowered, they have their gifts, they act totally differently with the world. They become, instead of takers that are like drowning person, they become enabled people that can help other people learn how to swim or grow things or nurture reality. And I think this fusion is going to be very important. We've seen very bad examples, I think, a lot in the last century of how technologies can create separation. And studying living systems and integrating that in with technology and biomimicry, I think, is going to be a huge field uh, in the coming century. I just had a circuit blow. That's why I disappeared for a bit. We just had to restart the circuit. Anyway, glad we were able to carry on. <laughs> right as we're talking about technology, ironic. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, just to finish the thought. Um, as Chris was saying earlier, you know that we might go from eight or nine billion down to two billion, could happen. Uh, but another way of looking at it is that it seems like most of, if if not a great many, of the uh, things that people put their energies into, the businesses, the industries, the things we consume, really don't have any place in. An enlightened world, as most of it, most of us would conceive of it, you know. And if that is true, and if we are going to transition to a very different world, a, a so-called enlightened world, then probably all these things are going to have to crumble. And the the crumbling process could be extremely uh, traumatic for people who are invested, literally and figuratively, in all those things. That's the whole chestnut about attachment, isn't it? And it's the, the root of all suffering. It's like we become very attached, you know, to our to our way of living in in, uh, in 21st century Western culture, and the third world craves what we've got, and so there's this trickle down effect, and everyone is attached to this paradigm, which is 
basically dying and basically, you know, transforming at the same time. You know, they, they want more of that as it's transforming. So how do we how do we lose our attachments? And the ego dissolving of uh, deep meditation or of psychedelics and substances like that can be a catalyst for, um, you know, letting go of attachments, although at other times it can also exacerbate and strengthen um, some of those uh, ego desires and attachments as well. So there's there's no easy pathways, but uh, that's that's the mission ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Rick, I'd like to double back around to your observation of the power of spiritual persons or persons who do deep spiritual practice. A different image. Um, I mean, if you uh, you know if you run your finger in the water, if you stick your finger in the river, and a ripple spread out from the division point of your finger, it's just a finger, but it has a much broader effect or an image uh, that comes to mind frequently from working in deep states. It's like uh, when you go deeper and deeper and deeper in, you know, into the structure of the collective psyche and into the, the deep constitutional patterns that hold humanity in certain dynamic configurations, uh, if you can cause a small shift at the deep collective level, that can ripple out in time almost in an earthquake-like fashion at, at eventually in a large uh, effect at, a, at the social or the uh, collective level. So it's to me a, a spiritual practitioner is like um, the diamond bit that's drilling deep within the earth and deep within the collective psyche. It takes an extremely hard substance to crack these very, very deep levels. And uh, if you read the biographies of the, of the autobiographies of great saints, they, you know, they knew these territories. They, they were entering into collective hells. They were entering into terribly arduous processes. They were uh, experienced enormous suffering. Uh, but they kept plowing through and kept pushing through until eventually uh, the light that they were able to bring to focus was able to penetrate and, and have an effect on very, very deep collective shadows. Those, I think, can have a very profound radiating effect. And anyone who's doing spiritual practice is kind of hardwired into other people who are doing spiritual practice so that we are all sort of dropping shafts into these very deep collective shadows. Beautiful. Another metaphor I find handy is if you think of a river, if you want to change the course of a river, if you try to do it at the mouth of the river where it enters the ocean, it's too late. The river has already run its course. Mm -hmm. You know, If you go halfway upstream, you can change it quite a bit, at least half of it maybe. Um, but if you could get to the source of the river, then metaphorically speaking, although you wouldn't mm -hmm. probably really do this, you could send it off in any direction because you're at the source from which it springs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, spiritual practice can be seen as a way of swimming upstream, so to speak, in this river, getting back to the, to the very source of everything, and then by affecting change there, just a slight tiny shift can, can bring the ultimate outcome in a completely different direction than it was mm -hmm. otherwise going to go. So I'd just like to jump in. I, I think that's really great. I think it's, it's absolutely true that basically, if I you know, can use this term psychedelic activism, is uh, is the next step forward for a collective response, not just an individual response. Mm -hmm. And things like with, with entheogens and with ayahuasca, there is a focus on healing and the right context to it. And many people are sort of still going through their individual journeys and individual healings. Um, some people I know in the psychedelic community are already exploring this sort of avenue, this sort of collective work. I've over the years sort of taken part in a few different rituals where uh, I feel that when people are on the same psychic, morphic sort of uh, resonant frequency, when they're on, on the same journey together, some of the individual egos can be overcome and a gestalt can be created. And it's that gestalt type of consciousness which can actually either go deeper or be more effective in the, uh, in the, the astral or in the, the sort of psychedelic realms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's a very valuable tool that, you know, we, that should be explored more as a community, this idea of group work. I know that even with, say, the, the curanderos in Peru, quite often, and this is sort of a, a historical legacy thing, that many of the curanderos drink on Tuesdays and Friday nights, or they, they, they find that um, when there's more and more people on the astral all working with the energy at the same time, it builds the energy, and so it, it's, it's easier to work when there's a collective out there on that same playing field. And 
I don't see this happening that much in the, uh, the entheogenic community at the moment, but in the psychedelic community, and we we're talking right at the start about the difference between thrill seekers and see seekers, some, some people who are working on this group sort of modality work uh, are, are doing it, you know, not for their own healing and not on an individual level, but on a group level. And I see this happening. There's, a, there's some DMT communities, and there's a, there's a, um, a well-known website called DMT-Nexus, and it's it's a sort of a learning community, and a, it has a lot of different forums and things like that. But they've previously done experiments with like a, a group DMT ritual and things. You know, if I look at the tribal level, I guess you know there were many many indigenous tribes that would basically trip together or would take sacraments together and do it in a group scenario. And it's something which is sort of overlooked in this first this current wave of of um, ayahuasca usage. But there's something that's not important about the bonding that happens to a group which does enter altered spaces together. And then also I think the guest alt and the, the creative potential that's, that's available. And you know, as, as Chris said as well, I think that some of the, um, the best work that can be done is in the, uh, the, 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 the formative realms. Because all of this manifestation in the world, as you were saying as well, um, Rick, this is, you know, it's almost too late. It's already manifested, it's already concrete and it's hardened. If you can, if you can work on the the upper upper levels of, of vibration and the slightest little tweaks, as you were saying, and especially if you can do it in a measurable way, if it's not something as you know all encompassing as world peace or whatever, but you could do uh, psychedelic activism for really uh, direct results, you know, on a very measurable way. Um, I, I think that is a, a very very powerful tool that we should be exploring uh, as conscious communities. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that, Can for instance, have, oh, go ahead, Tom, Jonathan. Well, I mean, Rock just inspired me because uh, I felt like I got a real treat in the Santo Daime Ayahuasca Mystery Schools because there's not one shaman singing the Akaros, the healing songs, which seem to, everyone does, and they're received channeled songs. People don't just write these, they come to them. And I think the act of singing in group is one of the most healing things we can do for the ego and letting go because we're harmonizing, we're coming into vibration. And you'll see in these daime ceremonies, it's just like the finest line of beauty. And if you have someone singing too high, too low, making movements, it kills the wave. But when you all hit that sweet spot, you go on the most beautiful journeys together. And I really think a lot of the fighting we do, we're just in, we're not in harmony with each other. It, it sounds silly, but I really think if we could get like politicians to sing, get communities to sing, we might start just at a whole different resonant level. We're out of resonance right yeah. now, collectively, and I think that's a huge issue. And the sounds also activate the energy centers. So you know, the vowels are just very sacred things. The consonants mm -hmm. activate, the vowels release. So I'm hoping there's more medicine and just general healing work through song and vibration. Mm -hmm. Have you guys, uh, I think Terence McKenna commented on this, you know, back in the 90s when he was in some senses mythologizing ayahuasca use. But there's, a, there's an Amazonian tribe that would actually, uh, I think it, was, it might have been the DMT snuff ritual or it might have been ayahuasca, but he was saying collectively if they're on the same vibration and the same intent and they would sort of, um, they would all see the same, the same manifestation of this purple viscous fluid, this super fluid. And with it, they could sculpt into existence objects, like they could make things or they could sort of, you know, collectively work as a group. But this whole idea of a collective consensual um, trip into, the, into a reality where you're all seeing the same thing solidifies the, the truth of that and also helps steer the, the group towards, um, you know, the ability to, to manifest and to, to set goals and to realize them. And, you know, part of the, the origins of the psychedelic experience, according to anthropologists and and whatnot, is saying that you know the tribe would often use it as a hunting mechanism or something where they would, you know, draw on the cave walls the bison that they wanted to to find, and then the next day it would manifest, and they'd go out and they'd see the bison, and it would be there. And you know, to to really realize that psychedelics and entheogens can be very practical tools for a community and for a tribe um, to to work with and to manifest their immediate needs and to give back to the planet as well as taking in their manifestation. Mm -hmm. Here in Fairfield, Iowa, um, there are a couple large geodesic domes that have been here for about 30 years on the campus of uh, the TM Group University, Marshy University. And every day all throughout these 30 years, there have been anywhere from 1,000 to 
uh, during special courses, as many as 8,000 people all meditating together at the mm -hmm. same time for like, you know, at least four hours a day. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's kind of just mentioning it because it's part of that principle that you're mentioning, although it doesn't involve psychedelics. <laughs> but well, there, I don't there does. Think anything important about psychedelics is unique to psychedelics, that it also will manifest in any other, content, in other practices as well. Yeah. So the accumulation of effects that you're pointing to is very powerful. And it's measurable. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, you can measure various social indicators and see mm -hmm. if they correlate with the fluctuations in the numbers of people doing it. And, and they've done studies like that, gotten them published in peer-reviewed journals. Mm -hmm. And uh, just one thing to throw in with this whole point we're making now is that in nature there are a number of examples of... Uh, where very small numbers of elements in a system govern the whole system or can influence the whole system. For instance, in the heart, 1% uh, of the cells are pacemaker cells, and they, they kind of regulate the beating of the whole heart. Or in a laser, uh, the square root of 1% of the photons, if they line up coherently with one another, in, um, induce the, the other photons to become coherent, and the whole thing begin, begins behaving as a single photon. So... <clears throat> You know, we don't necessarily have to think in terms of X billion people all participating in some sort of intense mm -hmm. spiritual thing for huge social change to take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Backstroms, I haven't heard from you in a while. Have anything to say in all this? Well, there's, there's something coming up for me about this. Um, Played a little bit with the distinction just touched on it between these, um, all what somebody called up and out spirituality, um, uh, maybe more conventional kind of spiritual practices. They're more, um, I would think, more um, mm, post agricultural versus uh, indigenous practices. And just this last piece we were talking about, this is kind of speculation on my part, but my experience with the plants is that awakening that's engendered in those practices is much more embodied. Um, the, the traditions are traditions that are still in a, a constant daily interwoven contact with nature and we're using um, a plant spirit uh, rather than a, a spiritual practice, which is thought of as kind of coming from the what I'm going to call the masculine uh, expression of the divine. Yeah, just um, so my the sense that um, I've had, and and uh, as you mentioned, Rick. Um, yeah, I was here in in Fairfield uh, since the 70s as well, so. Uh, a long time with that more sort of rarefied uh, kind of spiritual practice. And then, um, yeah, I, I have to confess, I, I felt it wasn't really um, synchronizing very well with who I am, although I have recently started practicing DM again. But um, then over the years, got more and more drawn to these um, practices that are kind of, I don't know, we've got this earth-based um, uh, wording or they're just tying me through the body into the feminine manifestation of the divine mm -hmm. uh, matter, the mother. Um, that's, it's got a whole different feeling and to me it has a greater sense of promise in terms of our, as a species, being able to um, heal our relationship with the ecosystem, um, if you will, to kind of fit into that system in a way that's more harmonious. And not to detract from the, from the thousands in the dome, I mean, I just think if we're going to make it through this, we should try everything that's available to us and some kind of balance between these masculine and sometimes even hyper-masculine spiritual paths and what's now, you know, we're collectively becoming much more aware of, the, uh, the grounded, embodied, uh, feminine path to awakening. Um, I think it has a lot of promise for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. mentioning the dome thing as 
some kind of in, you know endorsement of it in any exclusive way. I, I'm just say, everybody's doing their thing, you know, and it, and I'm just I just use that as an example because of the you know what the other fellow was saying. Yeah, I mean I'm more drawing lines than you were. I acknowledge yeah. that, and, and I'm just saying I think the one is great, and I think we really need to be open to um, these different forms of spirituality that are being. Mm -hmm. made available to us by our brothers and sisters who've uh, mm -hmm. been spending all this time uh, barefoot. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I notice is that very often when people kind of step back from uh, a path that they had been deeply engaged in for many years, uh, very often they blossom. You know, some, some profound awakening yeah. takes place which is not to say that they sh had been wasting their time in that thing, but somehow it just, uh, you know, they, they've hatched. It's time to leave the incubator. And when they leave the incubator, then they can really begin to fly. So, yeah, kind of relates to what you're saying. Just be open to a, whatever your, your heart leads you to do. Yeah. If I can throw in maybe an historical point, um, my... You know, as someone who teaches world religions or taught for most of his life, I think we, about 5,000 years ago, when we began to break through and be, we began to develop the technology, the psychotechnologies to go beyond individual consciousness and began to experience the mother universe, you know, the universe which is the generative universe. I mean, when we began to experience that reality, and that reality is so much more instantly gratifying and satisfying than time-space reality in some ways. I mean, it led us to develop up-and-out cosmologies in all the religions, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Christian, Islamic, all the religions are basically variations on up-and-out cosmologies, which make perfectly good sense in the first phase of the discovery of that generating universe of that profound mother, the Buddha womb. And just explain what you mean by up and out. I know what you mean, but maybe some of the listeners won't get it. Well, I mean, where the goal is to achieve some type of realization, some enlightenment, and then leave the system. So right. that the first term the for Hinduism is moksha. So you achieve escape of moksha, escape from the planet. Who wants to be on the planet when you can be in heaven? So, um, so to achieve salvation, and salvation ultimately re is realized in an off-planet place or an off-planet condition, and all of the religions basically sought that. But that, to me, is a symptom of the relative psychological or psycho-spiritual half-maturity or immaturity of the human species at the time, because ultimately all the up-and-out cosmologies leave unanswered the question what, when God was existing, when the divine was existing in the pre-manifest state, why did God manifest the universe? Why did God self-manifest the universe itself? And now the, the more we understand the size of the universe and the complexity of the universe, the inherent intelligence of the universe, it, it, it basically undercuts the logic of the up-and-out cosmologies because it leaves unanswered the question, what's the purpose of, of time-space existence? Uh, and I think the, the shift we're going through is, is not only tied to specific practices like a psychedelic practice, but I think it's a profound philosophical, psychological shift to recognizing that awakening to the mother universe, awakening to transcendent realities is only the first step. It's, it, it is good to ground on that reality, it's good to open to that reality, but ultimately the evolutionary thrust is to connect that, re is to bring more of that reality into time and space. And, and in that process, I mean, this is Sri Aurobindo's fundamental insight. It's, it's an incarnational spirituality in contrast to an up and out spirituality. So we want open the doors, open the channels, bring it in and actualize it here. And I think as we do, we're going to find that uh, all sorts of limits that we thought were the limits of the human body are going to turn out to be the limits of the consciousness animating that human body so that we have much more open-ended potential for sensory acuity, for auditory acuity, for physical sensation, and we really are limited by the quality of consciousness that has yet been able to animate this particular biomass that we are. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What did you say, Rock? Just say amen. Uh -ho. Uh -ho. Uh -ho. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh -ho. 
Well, well, I agree. It's a very interesting uh, question. In, uh, just to jump in just very briefly there, um, mm -hmm. you know, my film documents some of my journeys on ayahuasca as well, but we there's a, a core part of the film where we, we're just lucky enough to have footage of a 5-MeO-DMT uh, experiment that we conducted in the jungles in Peru with a Western curandero and a, a Western mm -hmm. scientist with some brainwave uh, activity. And you know the, the 5-MeO experience, to shorthand it, is is a typically the white light tunnel merging with the, the Godhead type of uh, mystic um, experience and initiation. But it, it seems to me from my my experiences in that realm is that yes, I, I totally agree with Chris. Is that it's not just about the up and out. It's about the fact that the 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 explicate or the world that we inhabit, which has been created from the implicate. Is manifesting and it's grounding, and you know, as much as we're journeying up and out and and peering up above, you know, the the frequency uh, crash that we're in down here, we're recognizing there's a there's a interdimensional ecosystem, but it's also it's also at the same time feeding into our material plane and it's incarnating and it's anchoring, and so this idea of awakening and, and transcendence is a historical legacy from some of the world religions. Um, but I, I feel on a natural system that what's happening is that you know the Godhead or the the whole the whole engine of creation is such that it's incarnating into this material plane and it's manifesting. And so you know as part of the, the world shift and all these things that are happening, the divine is alive and well and it's incarnating on the earth through us and it wants to have more of that incarnation happening on the world. You know the the word is becoming flesh on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, this is wonderful stuff. Um, CL, were you about to say something? Yeah, just you know, that, that along the same subject of up and out spirituality, I was just even reflecting on even the word ayahuasca, which we haven't really talked about that much. So, wasca just means vine. The plant itself is a vining plant, and ayah has, has a couple of ways we might translate it, and one of the translations for ayah is soul. And to me, it is a plant medicine that takes me deeply into my soul, perhaps connected to other souls as well. But again, it's not to connect so much the ayahuasca experience. It's to connect me to my soul. It's, or, so it's kind of a downward descent into the interior world of my soul. The other word that I am is we might translate it in, and I'm really convinced that if we really understood these languages, probably soul or the other word death, Neither one of them would probably be adequate for the actual indigenous experience. But again, death, but it's not a, um, a dark, it's just like, again, it's going beyond our personality. It's into the, the more subtle world where the personality is exactly dead, but you know, under a, a deeply mystical place when mm -hmm. the personality is left behind. But again, it's just, I know we're talking about how when each of us individually can find our own souls and um, actually really befriend our own death, that we can then create an orientation towards life that is much more universal and compassionate and um, in, you know, with that interest in the collective, that it is so such an internal experience, an inward, not an upward and out to reach so much source, but a downward and in to reach mm. our nature. Mm. So I think that's mm. an aspect of this particular path that might make it unique from other contemporary paths that are yeah. more connecting this to source. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make any concluding remarks, or was that a good concluding remark right there? <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> good. I, we, I feel like we went into really wild territory for a, a talk that was just about psychedelics. I, I've, I feel really honored to have learned from all of you, and mm -hmm. I hope your community does too. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, well, I, I particularly feel honored. You know, I, I often feel like an amoeba doing this show because each mm -hmm. week I reach out and engulf a new person, you know, and, and kind of <laughs> listen to all their stuff and read their book if I, as much as I have time to do. And, and it, each time it sort of nourishes me and expands my world. But, you know, this week the amoeba has really bitten off a big chunk uh, <laughs> <laughs> interacting with all of you folks and, and you know, getting familiar with, with what you're doing. I, I really feel uh, nourished and enlivened and... Uh, more mature in my understanding of all of, of the whole spiritual 
landscape uh, as a result of uh, preparing for and, and doing this discussion. So I appreciate it. Thanks to you all. Thank um, you for. I just like to add Rick, maybe as a parting comment um, that you know basically, as I said earlier, all paths lead to the same central source in my understanding, and and what's right for one person might not be right for another, and so everyone should just trust the journey as it unfolds while still diligently pushing their own envelopes, you know, and questing and asking questions uh, themselves to be that seeker, you know, on the path. And it is the journey, not the destination. So, you know, trust the process that unfolds and, you know, uh, push yourself as much as you can. And, um, yeah, God bless. Yeah, there's a verse in the Gita which says, uh, one's own dharma, though lesser in merit, is better than, because one can perform it, one's own dharma, though lesser in merit, is better than the dharma of another. Better is death in one's own dharma. The dharma of another brings danger. Mm -hmm. So it kind of relates to what you just said. That basically, if we if we if we tune in and listen, we're gonna know what the next step is for us. And it's not necessarily what your next step or your next step is. It's what you know one's own next step is. If if you're sensitive to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, let me make a, just a few concluding remarks. Um, I won't bother reading all the names of the people we've been talking to. We've kind of done that in the beginning, and you've, you're familiar with it by now if you've listened this far in the interview. Um, I, I also won't bother just reading all the different websites that everybody has because that would be hard to get down anyway. But if, if this, this whole discussion will be on a page on batgap.com, and uh, if you go there, you will find short bios of each participant linking to their websites where you'll find longer bios, lists of their books, movies, whatever they're involved in, healing practices, uh, counseling things. There's a, there's a whole wealth of opportunity here. Um, so just go to backapp.com uh, and uh, you'll find that. There also you'll find a discussion group for each interview, and I, I suspect that the discussion on this one is going to be quite lively. Um, there's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking, makes it possible for me to do this. Uh, there's a place to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. You'll see that. And uh, there is both an alphabetical and a chronological list of all the interviews I've done. So, And there's also a link to the audio podcast um, if you'd like to just listen to the audio of this on your iPod, um, you can sign up for that. So that about does it. So thanks for listening or watching. We'll see you next week. Next week is going to be Lama Suryadas. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you.